All right, everybody, welcome back. So last video, we actually constructed a, a matrix factorization that encodes the Gram-Schmidt process. And this is known in the trade as the QR factorization of a matrix. And what this produces, remember, is a pair of matrices, Q and R, right? R is going to be a square matrix and Q is going to have the same size, we same size as A, okay? Right, because A, in some sense, we are thinking of its columns as being uh, an arbitrary, linearly independent set of vectors. Sometimes we think of them as bases for, uh, for the image space. But the point is that Q is supposed to be a better basis for that space than is than are the columns of A, right? So Q is supposed to have columns that are orthonormal. So not just orthogonal, Q is going to be comprised of orthonormal vectors by construction. And the R matrix here is going to be the collection of weights that we have to assign to each of these vectors in order to recover the original basis whose columns are in A. And what we would like to do with this is show that it's not just kind of an idle uh, observation that, hey, we can do this, that there is this nice way of setting this, uh, setting this computation, uh, setting this up in, uh, in the matrix setting. There's a reason why we want to do this, right? As with everything we do in this class, there is an eventual reason, right? An eventual uh, economical reason for us to solve matrix, matrix systems in this way or to factor them in a particular way. And here is how we're gonna work this out for, for QR matrices or QR factorizations. Remember that if we had an LU factorization, then we could solve this system, AX equals B, in two steps. First would be to recognize, first, first would be to recognize that this is uh, really me solving two different systems the first one being the, uh, the forward substitution system, right? That would be the L times Y equals B system. And then saying, oh, hey, I can go ahead and now solve a back substitution system, right? An upper triangular system, UX equals Y. So if we were able to, uh, if we were lucky enough to have an LU factorization, we could omit Gaussian elimination entirely and just do these two steps at a cost of about n squared flops a piece, as opposed to trying to solve this AX equals B system directly with Gaussian elimination, which would take on the order of n cubed steps or n cubed flops, which is significantly worse or significantly lengthier to do for large systems. We're going to try to do the same thing for a QR factorization. Right? So we're going to set this up. We're going to say, hey, qr times x is equal to b. And sure, that means that I can go ahead and say, let's solve the qy system here. Right? So y is equal to rx. In this system, I can go ahead and solve second, but it's really straightforward. It's still on the order of n squared flops. Right? It's an, it's an upper triangular system, so it's a back substitution, right? And that can be done in n squared, uh, n squared flops. But the real problem here is trying to deal with this Q matrix, right? What I would really like to be able to do here <clears throat> is say that I need to, uh, in order to solve for Y, in a theoretical sense, I could just go ahead and multiply this by Q inverse on the left. From, for both sides of the equation, and I will wind up with a solution for y. The problem is that we don't know what this Q inverse matrix looks like necessarily, right? And that's the whole reason why we haven't done this in the first place, is that these, uh, these computations to figure out what the inverse looks like are the same order of magnitude, the same number of flops that we would need in order to compute a Gaussian elimination in the first place, which is going to make this an entirely moot process. It doesn't make any sense to do it if we're gonna to have to do n cubed uh, flops or n cubed computations anyway. 
So what we'd like to do here is ask if there is some property of the Q matrix that we can invoke that will tell us what this inverse is without us having to actually compute it explicitly or directly with Gaussian elimination. And it turns out we are in luck. The way that we have designed this Q matrix, we know exactly what its inverse looks like. And I'll give you a quick observation here. Have a look at what Q transpose times Q does. Right, so Q transpose is going to be this uh, script Q matrix from before. And this is going to be a big column matrix, right? So this is, or a big column setup. So it's U1 transpose, so these are all hats, excuse me. So this will be U1 hat, hat transpose, U2 hat transpose, all the way down to UN hat transpose. And this is being multiplied into, oh, is that right? They're not transposes, are they? No, they're not. Let me double check. Let me double check, make sure I'm doing this, doing this right. Q is going to be set up with columns. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so these are going to be transposes. So U1 hat transpose, U2 hat transpose, all the way down to UN hat transpose. And that's the Q transpose. And I'm going to multiply this guy into Q. And Q is going to be U1 hat, U2 hat, and so on. And if I multiply these guys together, I wind up with U, what would it be, UI hat dotted with UJ hat. Now that's going to be Q transpose times Q and the ijth entry of that matrix. And that's exactly what I have up here in this big square matrix, Q transpose times Q. And sure enough, remember that this is an orthonormal basis or an orthonormal set of vectors. So this is precisely delta ij, which is zero everywhere except on the diagonal where the diagonal is all ones. That's the identity matrix. So that means that Q transpose times Q is the identity matrix. So what does that mean about Q transpose? Well, Q transpose would then behave exactly as the inverse matrix for Q. And this is exactly what we're doing here. We're saying, oh, well, make sure I didn't erase anything. There we go, yep. Means that Q inverse and Q transpose are actually the same matrix, and specifically when Q is square. I want to make it very clear. Right? This only works for, for square matrices. But that's what we're going for. We're trying to show that there's an easy way to compute the inverse of the Q matrix where we actually don't have to compute a damn thing. All right? So, in a more general setting, we don't necessarily have a, a square Q matrix. We saw that in our example from last time. Q doesn't have to be square. But if it is, then we luck out with this computation that uh, we have a nice square matrix Q and we can ask for what the, the inverse of Q is. But in general, we don't necessarily have the square Q, but we still satisfy this property that Q transpose times Q and it turns out Q times Q transpose are going to equal the same identity matrix. Right? They're going to be the same size. So basically, what we are saying is that an orthonormal set of columns in your matrix uh, means that your inverse is equal to your transpose. And that is a godsend from a practical linear algebra standpoint. We don't have to compute an inverse directly because we already have every piece of information about Q inverse sitting inside of the Q matrix. So if Q was just a plain old orthogonal set, or if, sorry, if Q is an orthogonal matrix, then this is exactly the computation that we got before. And orthogonal matrices have orthogonal columns, and in particular, it's kind of a weird uh, choice of verbiage here, a weird choice of terminology that we don't say an orthonormal matrix because the columns themselves are orthonormal. 
But if we're saying an orthogonal matrix, we do mean that the columns of that matrix Q are an, uh, form an orthonormal set with respect to the standard Euclidean pro uh, dot product. So the big takeaway here is that an orthogonal a matrix is orthogonal if and only if its columns are orthonormal with respect to the standard dot product. All right. And as an example, there are lots of ways that we can compute orthogonal uh, orthogonal matrices in R two. And in fact, all two by two orthogonal matrices look like the rotation matrices that we saw in linear algebra the first semester, right? So you can show this. It's actually kind of easy for a two by two matrix to show this. A little bit trickier for three by three to show that it looks like uh, spherical coordinates instead. But what we wind up with is that every single uh, orthogonal matrix looks like a rotation with maybe uh, a reflection. Okay, but what we're saying here is that Q is going to take your standard Euclidean, your standard uh, basis elements of Rn and rotate them and reflect them in a rigid fashion. Okay, so we're trying to maintain that, uh, that orthogonal structure on the vectors and the Q matrix is going to reflect that. It's going or rotate it. <laughs> uh, it's going to encode that information for you, that every orthogonal matrix is just a rotation modulo or reflection. Okay. And we come to the following, that if Q is an orthogonal matrix, then its determinant has to be plus or minus one. And this isn't too much of a shocker, especially when we just uh, remember how determinants work across products, right? The determinant of the product matrix A times B distributes, right? The determinant of A times the determinant of B, right? And if we know that an orthogonal matrix has to satisfy this equation, that Q transpose Q has to be the identity matrix, and we know that the identity matrix has determinant one, and based on our decomposition here, the determinant of Q times the determinant of Q transpose has to be equal to one here, but the determinant of Q transpose is the determinant of Q. So this is the determinant of Q squared, and that has to be one. So no problem here. It's not too shocking that these guys have to be isometries of, uh, of whatever space you're working in, okay? They, they can't scale areas, okay? They have to maintain that uh, rigidity uh, very, very strongly. Moreover, the product of two orthogonal matrices is, matrices is still orthogonal, and you can see it directly, that if I have this product here, I transpose it so that I wind up with flipping the order and then transposing each of the pieces, I can reassociate the matrices, I can reassociate the multiplication, and each of Q1 and Q2 is an orthogonal matrix. Therefore, I collapse this guy from the inside so that I wind up with the identity matrix at the end. All right? Talk about controlled demolition there. That is a precision drop to the identity. All right, so we can show that these guys form a group actually. So the set of all orthogonal matrices is something called ON, right? It has a name, the N by N orthogonal matrices, and you can choose what field you want to work over. Uh, very important in some instances. But for right now, we usually just take this to be real matrices. Uh, complex in some instances, but most of the time just real matrices. And if we were to say that we're going to restrict this even further, since we know that we can only get a determinant of either plus or minus one, we are going to restrict this a little bit further and say that the set of special orthogonal matrices uh, is also a group. And in fact, they both form what are called Lie groups, right? So these are groups that have, uh, that can, that inherit a sort of topology uh, that we can define. There's a, a nice way of combining them algebraically, uh, 
but they behave very much like a topological manifold. Okay, so whatever that means, right, that's not a prereq for the class, but this is a good jumping off point if you want to start talking about symmetries. Right? Rotations preserve symmetries in some instances, and uh, if you don't include reflections, then you're sitting in S-O-N, and this is effectively going to be all of the rotations that you can do within R-N. Okay? And they form a group, strangely enough. So there's a lot of interesting math that, uh, that follows because they are groups, and there's a lot of interesting math that follows because they form a manifold. So we like to use both of them in practice, and, well, I'll leave it to you for, uh, for when you move on from here to see how you use these. But I think we're going to go ahead and kill this section of video. And next time, let's see, what are we doing next time? Aha! We're talking about uniqueness, right, and possibly modifying the Gram-Schmidt algorithm so that it performs uh, in a unique fashion and in a way that 